Well, welcome to church this Sunday morning. We're glad to see you uh, here in church, and if you're worshiping with us online, glad that you were able uh, to join us as well. And whether you're online or on site here, be sure to download our church app, and you can follow along in the section called Sermon Notes. If you like to take notes, it just makes it easy uh, to follow along. We're in a study right now of the Old Testament book of Daniel, and this series has been entitled, How to Be Brave. So I want you to turn to Daniel chapter 4, Daniel chapter 4. Now, I've entitled the message this morning, Being Brave When You Feel You're Going Crazy. All right, did anybody feel like they're a little crazy right now? Uh, School's starting, nobody knows what's going on, it's new waters for everybody to navigate. We're still navigating the mask thing, we're still navigating uh, the differences with social distancing and not social distancing and different rules changing on a very regular basis. But we're going to look at Daniel 4 and see where a king went crazy and what it means for our lives today. In his 1903 British playwright, Man and Superman, George Bernard Shaw wrote, There are two tragedies in life. One is not to get your heart's desire. The other is to get it. I want you to close your eyes for just a moment and imagine with me this scenario. You walk outside and you're standing on the roof of your palace. And before you lies the greatest empire the world has ever known to date. There are massive towers soaring and filling the skyline. There are huge decorative gardens all around you. Every known type of architecture is seen around you. And at the snap of your fingers, you could have a servant wait on you at any moment. It's kind of a nice picture when you think about it. And you can open your eyes, by the way. Some of you will go ahead and stay, keep those closed for the rest of the sermon. But it would be better if you opened them. Oh, when you go out and think about that, that is the world that King Nebuchadnezzar lived in and that he had created for himself. And one of the things we're going to see in the book of Daniel is King Nebuchadnezzar's great pride and Daniel's tremendous humility. So we come to Daniel chapter 4 today, and it's quite an unusual chapter, not just in the book of Daniel, it's an unusual chapter of all the chapters in the Bible. It is unique because of who wrote it. These are the words of King Nebuchadnezzar himself. If Daniel wrote the book, which we believed he did, he is including for us a perspective unlike any other. So here in chapter 4, we have a pagan king who's giving us reasons why you should worship God and how he himself learned to worship God. But this chapter is also unique because it pictures a powerful king who is humiliated. Now, we are going to see this king that he lost all of his sanity for a time. And there is a reason for it, though. It was to show King Nebuchadnezzar that he really wasn't the one in control of everything around him. There, in fact, was a greater king, God. So when you turn to Daniel chapter 4, and we're going to start actually at the end of the chapter because it gives us the purpose behind the rest of the chapter. So go to Daniel 4, but go down to the very last verse of the chapter, and it says, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the King of heaven, because everything he does is right and all his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. In 1971, Muhammad Ali was interviewed by Life magazine prior to his big fight with Joe Frazier. Ali said, there seems to be some confusion. We're going to clear up this confusion on March the 8th. We're going to decide once and for all who is king. There's not a man alive who can whip me. I'm too smart. I'm too pretty. I am the greatest. I am the king. I should be a postage stamp because that's the only way I'll ever get licked. The fight between Ali and Frazier was known as the fight of the century for the heavyweight boxing championship. Frazier won it in 15 rounds. King Nebuchadnezzar is about to have the fight of his life. Now remember, the Babylonian Empire is the largest empire the world has ever seen to date during this time. It stretched from the western border at Egypt to the eastern border, eastern border at the Persian Gulf. Daniel and his three friends, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, were from the area of Judah, but now they find themselves living in Babylon some 900 miles away. In that day, that journey would have taken four to five months. 
months. And even though King Nebuchadnezzar had overpowered God's people and brought them into captivity, Daniel knew that God was still in charge. Now, this captivity is actually a punishment of God's people they were receiving because of their disobedience and their idolatry. And so when we begin over in chapter 4 with verse 1, we're going to notice verses 1 through 3, a declaration towards God. Now again, remember, it is King Nebuchadnezzar writing chapter 4. And in that day, you began writing by signing your letter first. So in chapter 4, it begins with the words, King Nebuchadnezzar. To the peoples, nations, and men of every language who live in all the world, may you prosper greatly. It is my pleasure to tell you about the miraculous signs and wonders that the Most High God has performed for me. How great are His signs, how mighty His wonders. His kingdom is an eternal kingdom. His dominion endures from generation to generation. Now, this is a huge transformation in the life of King Nebuchadnezzar. In chapters 2 and 3 of Daniel, we saw where his subjects would often say, O king, be it pleased that you would live forever. And this king who was accustomed to being saluted in that manner is now acknowledging the only king who can really live forever. You know, I think there are times we all have in our lives where we feel like we might be invincible. That feeling, I think, seems to diminish as we age and the more experiences we get because we soon realize we become vulnerable and we are not invincible. Uh, Susan Krauss Whitborn in her book, The Search for Fulfillment, says, when you think you can't lose, that outcome is all but assured. And she elaborates how invincibility is a myth, and she quotes that verse from the Bible that says, and you can finish it for me, pride goes before a fall. We talked two weeks ago about King Nebuchadnezzar and his narcissism. Dr. Whitborn writes, It's clear that invincibility is a component of narcissism, as by definition. People high in narcissism cannot see or admit to their own flaws. They believe they're deserving of that special attention that they want everyone to give to them. Whitborn goes on to say that when we are adolescents, we tend to hit the height of our belief of being invincible. And that's because of the younger age, and yet you're nearing adulthood, plus experience has not yet tempered a teenager, and so a teenager can believe they're invincible. And she goes on in her book and indicates that social media brings out what she calls the personal fable in each one of us because we believe we have an audience that's following our every move. Oh, King Nebuchadnezzar believed that about himself. He believed he was the most important person alive on the face of the earth. He believed his kingdom and his empire were the greatest that had ever existed and that no one would ever take them down. Oh, the change that occurred in King Nebuchadnezzar's life was remarkable. He is going to have an experience that will remove all pride from himself and worshiping God was going to become a whole lot easier. Barb and I were with some friends for dinner down in Marietta over a week ago, and after dinner we were taking a walk along the Ohio River, and I looked over to our friends and I said, when I was 11 I swam across the Ohio River, and I told them the story of 10 of us doing that and our fathers finding out and then catching us as we swam back across. And I looked at that river a few days ago and thought, what were we thinking? I was was only 11 years old. We could have all easily drowned. There were barges going up and down the river a lot more then than there are even today. And I'm like, wow. you know. And then I got to thinking back. Well, I can tell you one of the reasons. That's 45 years ago. That's why I felt like I was invincible. I would never dream of trying to swim across the Ohio River today. We weren't thinking at all when we did that because we had this feeling, this superiority attitude of I'm invincible. Nothing can take me down. And you will never have a relationship with God when you're feeling invincible. We only seek God when we're really feeling ourselves very vulnerable. And so I want us to see what happened to King Nebuchadnezzar that transformed him. Because he gives us a declaration of praise to God. But then in this chapter, we get a description of his humiliation. Look down at verse 4. 
I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at home in my palace, contented and prosperous. I had a dream that made me afraid. As I was lying in bed, the images and visions that passed through my mind terrified me. Now, remember, the king is in the prime of his life. He is in the prime of his reign. His empire is the largest in all the world. His royal treasury is bursting with money. But instead of settling back and trying to enjoy all of that, the king finds himself sitting on pins and needles. And as with his dream in chapter 2, King Nebuchadnezzar calls for his wise men to give him some answers, but they could offer him no help, and in walks Daniel. Look at verse 8. Finally, Daniel came into my presence, and I told him the dream. You know the way it's written there? It says this, finally, the person that's going to be truthful with me, that's going to tell me about my dream, is here in the room. He's like, Daniel, I'm so glad to see you. Now it goes on. He is called Belteshazzar after the name of my God, and the spirit of the holy gods is in him. I said, Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians, I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in you, and no mystery is too difficult for you. Here is my dream. Interpret it for me. Now understand at this point, the king is still pagan. He is calling Daniel by the name given him once he arrived in Babylon, which was Belteshazzar. And the king believes Daniel can interpret his dream, but he's not going to give him the appropriate credit for it. Now, if I were King Nebuchadnezzar, I would be somewhat afraid to fall asleep at night because of the dreams I might have. Have you noticed he has a lot of strange dreams here in Daniel? In our house, I'm sometimes afraid to fall asleep at night, not because of dreams that I might have, because I'm fearful that my wife might still be awake, and if she's upset with me over something, or if she can't sleep because I'm snoring so loud, I might suddenly feel the pillow burying my face and blocking my breathing. That's why I'm afraid to fall asleep at my house. Look down at verse 10. These are the visions I saw while lying in bed. I looked, and there before me stood a tree in the middle of the land. Its height was enormous. The tree grew large and strong, and its top touched the sky. It was visible to the ends of the earth. Its leaves were beautiful, its fruit abundant, and on it was food for all. Under it the wild animals found shelter, and the birds lived in its branches. From it every creature was fed. In the visions I saw while lying in bed, I looked, and there before me was a holy one, a messenger coming down from heaven. He called in a loud voice, cut down the tree and trim off its branches, strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the animals flee from under it and the birds from its branches." But let the stump and its roots bound with iron and bronze remain in the ground in the grass of the field. Let him be drenched with the dew of heaven. Let him live with the animals among the plants of the earth. Let his mind be changed from that of a man. And let him be given the mind of an animal till seven times pass by for him. The decision is announced by messengers. The holy ones declare the verdict so that the living may know that the Most High is sovereign over all the kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes and sets over them the lowliest of people. That is the dream that I, King Nebuchadnezzar, had. Now, Belteshazzar, tell me what it means, for none of the wise men of my kingdom can interpret it for me. But you can, because the Spirit of the Holy God is in you. Oh, as the king is telling Daniel about the dream, I can see Daniel's eyes just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And I think the look on his face, Daniel's changing countenance, had to have been very noticeable. Look at verse 19. Then Daniel also called Belteshazzar was greatly perplexed for a time, and his thoughts terrified him. So the king said, Belteshazzar, do not let the dream or its meaning alarm you. Belteshazzar answered, my lord, if only the dream applied to your enemies and its meaning to your adversaries. You know what? Daniel knew exactly what the dream meant, and he was going to become fearful enough to tell it to the king. I know none of us like wearing the mask. Trust me, I am thankful for efficiency in worship service that we don't have to wear a mask so that communication is clear. But another reason that we have trouble with others wearing masks is we can't read facial expressions. And so they, they cover up our facial expressions. Now, admittedly, most people look much better covered up by a mask, but they don't always, you can't see what's going on with them facially. The New York Times in late June had an article entitled, Masks Keep Us Safe, But They Also Hide Our Smiles. And the article notes, in anxious times, we may want to put neighbors, mail carriers, store clerks, and others at ease with a casual smile. But if our smiles can't be seen, how do you greet people? How do you reassure them? How do you flirt? 
Are there workarounds? Is there a squint, a head tilt, a raised eyebrow? It's a conundrum that is stumping many people who want to be both socially responsible and friendly. You know what? Daniel's conundrum was the exact opposite because the king could see Daniel's facial expression, and Daniel probably wanted to try to hide what he knew was going to happen to the king. And so the exact, exact opposite occurred. If any of you use facial recognition to unlock your cell phone, have you noticed masks are an issue? It doesn't recognize you anymore. Um, I, I, just a few weeks ago when we have to start wearing the mask, I put up my phone and I have facial recognition on mine or a thumbprint recognition, and I put it up and the first thing, it popped up this little box, we cannot recognize your face. I'm looking in the mirror going, I can't either. You know, I can't recognize it either. But I don't like the mask because I can't see your facial expressions while I am preaching. I know you're still laughing at the jokes. I just can't tell that you're laughing at the jokes. I see some of you, though, rolling your eyes. I do see that. I can see that. But the interpretation of the first part of the dream, Daniel is happy to share with the king. King, basically it is your branches, that large tree, and the branches as your empire stretched out over the entire known world at the time. But it's the next part of the dream that really frightens Daniel, and this is where he would have liked to have hidden his facial expression. It begins in verse 23. Your majesty saw, Holy One, a messenger coming down from heaven and saying, Cut down the tree and destroy it, but leave the stump bound with iron and bronze in the grass of the field while its roots remain in the ground. Let him be drenched with the dew of heaven. Let him live with the wild animals until seven times pass by for him. This is the interpretation, Your Majesty. This is the decree the Most High has issued against my Lord the King. You'll be driven away from people. You will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like the ox. You'll be drenched with the dew of heaven. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign in all the kingdoms of the earth, and He gives them to anyone as He wishes. Well, the king is being told by Daniel that your kingdom is going to be lost and that you, king, are going to be reduced from an emperor to an animal. So mental illness, there's going to be a mental illness that's going to plague King Nebuchadnezzar for a period of seven years. Now, why would this occur? Well, it occurred ultimately so the king would recognize that the real king is God. It is God who raises kings. It is the Lord who brings them down. Now, look at how the king is going to live and behave. He's going to be driven away from the people. He's going to live with wild animals. He's going to eat grass like ox. He's going to be drenched with dew. By the way, there is actually a legitimate term for this issue. It is called lycanthropy. Lycanthropy is a term used with a unique mental illness. Now, I want you to, if you don't take anything else from this sermon, this is a new word you can use. It'll come in handy later on this week. You can be sitting next to a table and you see somebody that's acting a little crazy over at the next table. Just look at your spouse, look at the person with you going, lycanthropy. That's what it is. It's lycanthropy. Lycanthropy means the ability or power of a human being to undergo transformation into a wolf or to gain wolf-like characteristics. Oh, the word that you may hear sometimes that would be the best word to describe lycanthropy actually occurs in fables, but it would be very close to what King Nebuchadnezzar is experiencing here. It actually becomes the word werewolf. That is where we get the word werewolf from is from this mental illness that is called lycanthropy. So picture in your mind for a moment how the king would normally be dressed. He would normally be in royal robes. He'd have on a tire as being one of the wealthiest people in the world. He would have golden scepters. He would have rings, all kinds of jewelry. But his appearance is now going to change. It's going to look like gross neglect of himself. His nails are going to be uncut. They're going to grow two to three inches long. They're going to begin curving around his fingers and his toes. His hair would become bristly and thick thick and be unkempt. He would be unshaven, allowing his face to be covered with hair. He would take on the resemblance of a wild animal. And the idea here in chapter 4, literally for King Nebuchadnezzar, is King, you are going to be utterly humiliated. That's what he's going to experience. Billionaire Howard Hughes died in 1976. 
He was not only eccentric towards the end of his life, being reported that for days on end he would lie in the bed wearing no clothes and staying in a dark room because he was fearful of catching any kind of germs. But Hughes' physical appearance became horrifying. His straggly beard hung to his waist. His hair reached the middle of his back. His fingernails grew over two inches long. His toenails grew until they resembled yellow corkscrews. And one of the richest men in the world, and he lived with some kind of illness that made him look beastly-like. And that would have been King Nebuchadnezzar. Verse 26. The command to leave the stump of the tree with its roots means that your kingdom will be restored to you when you acknowledge that heaven rules. Therefore, your majesty, be pleased to accept my advice. Renounce your sins by doing what is right, your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. It may be that then your prosperity will continue. Remember, Daniel's been with this king now for more than two decades. And the easiest thing at this point would have been for Daniel to walk away, but he cared enough for this king to confront him. In his classic work, Caring Enough to Confront, David Augsburger says that Christians need to learn care fronting. Care fronting is being up front with important facts that can call out new awareness to a person and provide them insight about themselves and it can unite the love that you have with another with the truth. Augsburger writes, in such honesty, one can love powerfully and be powerfully loving. And that was Daniel. Daniel had the power of God within him. He had the Spirit of God living within him to say, as bad as this king is, I'm going to stand here and love him, and I'm going to stand here and love him enough to speak the truth with him. Now remember, this is the king who had already thrown three of Daniels into a fiery furnace in the previous chapter, and yet they were saved by God. But this king knew no limits when it came to torturing someone who disagreed with him. So can you imagine what he might do to somebody who might dare confront him? So the king has a dream. Daniel interprets the dream. God fulfills the dream. Verse 28. All this happened to King Nebuchadnezzar. So everything we just got described from verse 1 down to this verse, everything that these dreams were telling him was going to happen, it simply says in a few words, all this happened to King Nebuchadnezzar. Twelve months later, as the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, he said, Is not this the great Babylon I have built as the royal residence by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty? King Nebuchadnezzar was about to experience that proverb, Pride goes before what? A fall. Notice how he viewed this empire. He said, is not this the great Babylon I have built as my royal residence? It was built by my mighty power. It was built for the glory of my majesty. And all that was predicted occurred. And for seven years, the king wandered like a werewolf in the fields and was away from people. Now, we don't know if the king's officials kept him hidden somehow or how there weren't lots of questions about all of this. We're just simply not given those details. But at the end of those seven years, the king recognized who the real king was and he acknowledged God's power. Verse 36. At the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven. My sanity was restored. I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified who lives forever. At the same time that my sanity was restored, my honor and splendor were returned to me for the glory of my kingdom. My advisors and nobles sought me out, and I was restored to my throne and became even greater than before. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the King of heaven because everything he does is right and all his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble He had experienced all that. He knew, in fact, God was able to humble him. I have several preacher friends that we trade our sermons around every week. We'll send them back and forth to each other, and we'll give comments. And we may not be preaching the same thing, or sometimes we're preaching through a series together. I sent my sermon off on Wednesday afternoon to a good friend of mine, and he sent it back to me. He says, well, I learned two things from your sermon. I said, what are those two things? He said, number one, if you don't take care of pride in your life, you're going to turn into a werewolf. He said, and number two, obviously you're going to die by suffocation, by pillow at some point in your life. Now, what are the directions for us from this chapter as we think about this weird scenario that goes on of King Nebuchadnezzar and seven years of ruminating like a beast out in the fields? Here's the first one. 
Acknowledge and prioritize God in your life. Acknowledge and prioritize God in your life. King Nebuchadnezzar acknowledged himself, but not God initially. He had within himself a feeling of power and control that said, I can have whatever I want, when I want, and pride is the path eventually to all sins. Oliver Wendell Holmes said, Sin has many tools, but a lie is a handle which fits them all. Pride is when you begin to lie to yourself. Pride can keep you from seeking advice. Well, it's my way. Pride can keep you from praying. Oh, I don't need God's input. Pride can ruin a friendship. Well, my feelings were hurt. Pride can cause an affair. I can do this and not get caught. Pride can exasperate greed. I need this. No one will get hurt over my having it. Pride can entice drinking. I owe myself this because I work so hard. Jesus one time told about a man who wanted to keep increasing his wealth. That was his main goal. And his pride got in the way of remembering that eventually eternity would be at stake. And as a farmer, he had an abundant harvest and he focused on himself. And his words in the New Testament sound much like King Nebuchadnezzar's words in the Old Testament. In Luke 12, verse 18, then he said, this is the farmer speaking, this is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store up my surplus grain. And I will say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. And then Jesus told his disciples something very sobering, something that we all have to face. Luke 12, verse 20, but God said to him, to the farmer, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who's going to get what you've prepared for yourself? This is how it'll be for whoever stores up things for themselves, but it's not rich towards God. So all this farmer's hard work was going to benefit somebody else because he's going to die that night. And when you focus on yourself over God, you sometimes forget that this world and everything in it, your position, your possessions, they're all temporary. And this man in Jesus' parable forgot one thing. He forgot God. And he was watching out only for himself. And King Nebuchadnezzar had forgotten God too. You know, none of us really control anything. We can place our money in an investment account, and depending on the stock market, it could lose a lot of money in one day. Some of you had that happen back in late March. We could be driving our vehicle down the road thinking we're in control of our destination and suddenly somebody swerves and we overreact and we're launched into the median and we're overturned. Nebuchadnezzar, by the way, is not an example of bravery. The series we're going in right, that we're in right now, Daniel, is how to be brave. Nebuchadnezzar was not brave. He was trying to hide his inferiority complex in his things. And he trusted himself more than he trusted God. That is not being brave. That is being foolish. And the king's dream, it opened his eyes. Kyle Eidelman, who wrote the book Not a Fan, said, Success can change your perspective about God in eternity. Ask yourself if it's worth having your dreams and missing God's dream. See, being brave means trusting God over yourself. Well, should I take care of... Investing correctly? Should I take care of myself? Yes, you should. But you need to always remember first and foremost who's in charge of everything you have. Who gave it to you? Who can as quickly take it away from you? You say, well, I think it's good to be prudent. Well, it is good to be prudent with finances and with your possessions and learn how to use things correctly. It's good to do all of that. But if that's your main goal, you're not being brave. You're being foolish. You're running scared. Because you don't believe God can do it. You believe you can, but you don't believe God can. Being brave means you realize there's a God, and you're not Him. And that's exactly what King Nebuchadnezzar had to learn. Number two, beware of subtle pride in your life. Beware of subtle pride in your life. Now, King Nebuchadnezzar's pride was obvious. His empire was massive. His power was enormous. He had invaded many countries and had taken citizens captive. Most people who struggle with pride don't do so overtly. They do it subtly. Pride is often seen in how maybe we treat other people. Pride is often an attitude that is expressed. 
I've seen posts, and you have too, from people that, from on social media about those maybe who work in places like Walmart or other stores, and they're at the entrances, and they're instructed to tell customers right now, if you don't have on a mask, you cannot enter. And some customers, you've seen these cases where they've ranted with them, and the employee is simply standing there doing her job. But the customer portrays the attitude, others need a mask, I don't. I, I, I don't need one. I'm invincible, is what it says. Or you might mention your new vehicle, and it becomes a source of pride. And yet when you get home and you take your shower, you're using towels that are wedding gifts from 30 years ago. Have you ever noticed that? We can have, we have pride in one thing, and then we look over and we go, we can really be humbled so quickly. When Barb and I moved from our house to our condo just a little over three years ago, we finally threw away towels and washcloths that were wedding gifts 33 years before. And they were, we had towels that just had, they were just frayed. I mean, you know, the, the, the hem part was gone. There was no border on, I, I can see you're shaking your head. You all have the towels like that, don't you? You have the same towel. You know, I, you know, I figured they were, they were gifts for a lifetime. They should have gone another 30 years. But they don't do that, do they? They wear out. And so we can be so proud about one thing and think, we have got it all together here, but then the next thing is, it just, it just falls apart. We learned out, hey, guess what? Everything in this world is so temporary. We can become even proud over the fact that we're not materialistic. We can even be proud of the fact that we're doing without. You can even become proud of your spiritual disciplines. Jesus often dealt with a group of the Jews called the Pharisees. They were the legalistic group of the Jews, and they were known to be arrogant about their spiritual disciplines. And some of the Pharisees loved putting on these long, haggard faces so that everyone knew they were fasting and they would get praise for their spirituality. And so they would walk around looking all gloom-like. Oh, I'm praising God. You know, they just wanted to look so good. They want everybody to notice, listen, we're fasting. It's because we're so spiritual. Verse 16 of Matthew 6 says, When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others they're fasting. Truly, I tell you, they've received their reward in full. But when you fast, you put, a, you oil, your he, put oil on your head and wash your face so it will not be obvious to others that you're fasting, not only, but only to your Father who is unseen. And your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Do you ever think about Bible knowledge, your prayer life, your giving? All those spiritual disciplines can become a source of pride at times if you're not cautious. So beware of subtle pride that can creep in. Here's one other application. Care enough for others to give or receive spiritual direction. Care enough for others to receive or give spiritual direction. And you're talking about an area where you need to be brave. The one thing that will ruin any of us spiritually is pride. It's the pride to refuse help. It's the pride to offer help. Daniel was brave enough to confront the king and tell him the truth. By the way, this doesn't mean you become the spiritual police over everybody. But it does mean when you care deeply for someone and you see them strained spiritually, you swallow your pride and you approach them. Or if someone approaches you about your spirituality, you have enough humility to listen. Galatians 6 verses 1 and 2 says, Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves or you also may be tempted Carry each other's burdens, and in this way, you'll fulfill the law of Christ. When it becomes a burden to you that somebody is living outside the will of God and you know they know better, or when somebody sees you're living outside of what God intends for their life, and it becomes a burden, it is time to approach. Three or four years ago, I used a phrase in a sermon around Christmas time, and after the first service, a person whom I greatly respect here came up to me and said, you know the phrase you used to describe this, and then he gave me the phrase, he said, it just didn't sound appropriate, and he said, I really think you could probably choose a better phrase to describe that, and so I had two options. The first option was not listen to the person, use the original phrase, leave my notes the same, go on through the other two services. Or number two was to listen to the person and in a very abbreviated time span between the services make an adjustment. And as soon as the first service was over and he caught me in the hallway, 
I went down the hall to my office, made a couple of changes, print out a new set of notes, and I chose to make the adjustment. And one reason is because I respected the person. But another reason is because of the humble spirit with which they came. And they said, I just wanted to suggest this might sound better this way versus this way. Daniel approached the king with a humble spirit. Bravery is not about who's the loudest, who's the most obnoxious. It's about who is willing to do the right thing when it can be scary. There is a lie of Satan that we all occasionally buy into, and it is this. I can fix this myself. And that lie resonates with our culture because we place a high premium on independence and self-sufficiency. And if we do ask for help, maybe it's with a project around our house, we, we most likely are not going to ask for help spiritually. And that's when the battle inside of us begins. And that's when we begin to drive ourselves crazy. Because what happens is very often we start to stray from God instead of getting closer to Him. Because we can rationalize any of our behavior and attitudes and say, God, it's okay with God. Hey, by the way, not everything is okay with God. There are a lot of things that are not okay for us to think or to do or to be according to God. And King Nebuchadnezzar was told by Daniel that he needed to do what was right. Is there an area for you where there is a struggle and you need spiritual guidance? Maybe it's in your money. Maybe it's in your marriage. Maybe it's with your children. Maybe it's with aging parents. Maybe it's in your business. Maybe it's in your career. But when you care enough to give or receive spiritual guidance, there can't be any pride. Only be humility. King Nebuchadnezzar went through a humiliating experience, but so did another king named Jesus. His humiliating experience was on a cross on a hill called Calvary. So passers-by could jeer and could mock at him. And Jesus' own family in the earlier years of his ministry thought he was crazy. But by the time the experience of the cross occurred, they were beginning to learn Jesus' purpose in coming to this world. Hebrews 12, verses 2 and 3 say, Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. And you cannot enter into a time of communion with pride. You can only enter it with humility recognizing who Jesus was and what he was willing to endure and the reason that he came to this earth, you can't do that with much pride in your heart because it takes it out of you to see the humiliation of Jesus on the cross. If you were able to pick up your communion packets as you came in, get those out and we'll get ready to partake. If you were unable to pick up one this morning as you came in or forgot to, you can pick those up as you leave this morning. Let's pray and we'll partake together. Our Father, we thank you for an opportunity to be reminded that uh, we need to come to you in a humble relationship, that in a relationship with you there is no room for pride, there is only room for our hearts to be softened and for the hardness of pride to be removed. And God, when we even try to envision what happened upon the cross on the hill of Calvary, it is impossible for us to adequately visualize what the cross would have really looked like. But yet, it's not masked over for us. Your word clearly tells us about the disfiguration of Jesus and what he was willing to endure. And we thank you for what he did for us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Take the bread that represents Christ's body and let's eat together. And the juice represents Christ's blood that flowed from the cross. Let's partake together. You cannot enter into a time of communion with pride, only humility. And you cannot enter into a relationship with God with pride, only humility. You know, I think that's one of the reasons that the Bible in the New Testament so adequately portrays that those who came to Christ were baptized into Him. Because it is an act of humility to say, I'm giving up my pride, I'm giving up my ego, I'm giving up my rights. 
And so this morning, when we dismiss in just a few moments, you can meet with me up in the front lobby area if you need to talk about what it means to accept Christ, what it means to confess that He is Lord, what it means to be baptized into Him. If you've already done that, I'd like to talk about what it means to have membership here, we'd love to have you be a part of our congregation we call Tri-Village Christian Church. I want to thank you for being here this morning. Thank you for your offerings. Remind you that you can put those in the black boxes in the hallway. You can mail them to the church. You can also do your giving online. And again, thank you for your continued uh, generosity and financial support. If you'd like information about church in the weekly email, if you don't get my PS weekly email on Thursdays, you can go to our church website, trivillage.org, click on Church Life, and underneath there it says weekly newsletter, and you can put in your email address, and that will be sent to you automatically automatically every Thursday. Let's continue to worship.